The first panel is called The End of the Beginning, uh, moderated by Darcy Gerbag. Where is the PWC people? Raise your hands. Last year, their media theme was The End of the Beginning. So let's see if anything's changed since the end last year. Darcy? Hello, my name is Darcy Gerberg. I've been a senior fellow at the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation for many years. My area has been digital television and uh, the impact of digital technology in media on it very broadly. I'm going to not take a lot of your time so that my speakers will have more time to give their presentations. I'm going to ask the speakers to come up one at a time in the order that you have them on your list. And then after they have finished speaking, they, it, by their choice, they can sit down to see the other, speak, the other talks or come up here. When our last speaker has finished, we'll all come up here to answer questions. Okay, uh, I'd like to uh, invite Ellie Nome. Oh, wait, excuse me, wait, wait. I'm sorry. We've sort of changed the order a little bit. We're going to have one of our uh, quick presentations of a startup first before this panel begins. And well, originally, the um the way we, uh, it, this was set up was that the uh, startup is actually um, sort of an example of what the panel is talking about, and, and um, the order was reversed. So uh, you'll see some of our ideas, and then hopefully we'll get the academic approval of them. Uh, so Stevie is a platform that automatically creates uh, TV lineups out of social media and online video. Uh, I usually actually do a live demo, but um, I was advised not to do that here. So um, I'll show you a really, really quick uh, video, and then I'll tell you about the future of TV the way we see it. This is TV, a great new channel made just for me. Stevie creates super cool TV that features me and my friends and everything we share. Status updates and tweets, news that matters, where to go, and who the party is. Like the best TV channels, studios have the cool shows, music men, sound plays, and DJs, artists, I follow. The comedy strip brings the funniest clips to the ads to them, because Stevie knows what's funny. I'm Slug TV, the hottest celebrities on Twitter are now my friends, so I get the latest adverts straight from the source. And I can always add between shows, skip to the next video, pause, like, and share. Stevie is full of fun and surprises, but all I really have to do is just lean back, so, um, so channels for my friends are already available on stevie.com. Just lean back and see what your friends are curating. Uh, we also have uh, the Stevie Guide, which is uh, hundreds and hundreds of channels based on Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, YouTube accounts um, that are already doing curation on the web for their fans, uh, we just take it and turn it into uh, a TV channel. Um, basically transforming uh, some of the, the content that's online, let's uh, say a magazine for example, is doing a lot of work online, a lot of video online, a lot of posts on Facebook and Twitter, um, but right now on TV it'll be just, or on a big screen it'll be just text. Uh, Stevie takes it and creates an automatic lineup um, out of that content and lets you see the TV, the magazine as a, a TV show. Um, but I'd like to share with you what we're actually, uh, what we're actually building at TV. Um, what we're creating is the basis and the engine for the future TV lineup. Um, we feel that linear TV is, is not going away. People like to zap, people like to be surprised still, uh, but it can't be the way it is today. It can't be the same for everyone. It can't be uh, 24 hours of you know, an editor sitting somewhere deciding what everyone is going to watch. And we see with, with time shifting and the amount of time shifting that's going on that, um, that, that linear TV needs to change. Um, so what we have is patent pending technology that puts together, as I said, multiple sources um, to allow for a personal lineup, basically. Um, we have current premium content and uh, social content or, or user-generated content wrapped together in the same lineup. So there's a lot of uh, uh, social TV apps and a lot of social TV going on that's 
separating the screens, right? So you have the uh, premium content on a big screen and then uh, what everyone's talking about on the smaller screen. Uh, we believe that this actually will be um, unified into one, one lineup in one screen. Um, we're talking about always updated TV, TV that you can actually skip forward and, and skip backwards and you can, you can run the lineup uh, backwards and forwards and um, you don't get reruns unless you want them. So the system knows what you've watched, it will give you new, new content all the time um, and if you want to rerun them, you just go to, to, to things that you've already seen. Um, and it's always social. So, um, so as I said, there's always the social aspect is always around um, the premium content. Now, um, Stevie's on all these platforms right now. Um, Android and Samsung TV coming soon. It's uh, iOS and, and uh, web and, and Windows 8 right now. Um, but I just want to uh, close this brief. <coughs> taste um, by saying that we believe that the TV in the future is going to look a lot more like Stevie. People are going to uh, expect their TV to know who they are, who their friends are, uh, what they're excited about, and um, we're there to bring them awesome TV. Thank you. What I will talk here about are three things. Technology elements of fourth generation TV media industry structure, and policy issues. Now, technologists have made all of this possible, and you know about Moore's Law. Here he is, he's the guy on the left. And, uh, and, and uh, he postulated that approximately 40% growth rate of technological capabilities, speed up, price down, uh, that has been driving this and has given media people these new tools, it's not only for processing, but also for transmission. Here you see the, um, here you see the wired versus wireless uh, speed rates, and you see that they're actually accelerating from their already enormous speed in recent years. And that makes different televisions possible. Now, the first generation of television was in the 1940s, early 50s in Israel, more like early 70s, um, uh, analog over the air. And that was then replaced by multi-channel cable, satellite, numerous channels. And the most recent generation has been the one of digital, t digital TV, IPTV, including IPTV, including uh, DTV and the various uh, approaches that have existed, but that's not the end of the story, even though we are still struggling to introduce digital television, because we are now going to move into a fourth generation. Now, what are the elements of fourth generation television, which are basically online type TV? They include a whole bunch of things, such as much larger and sharper television, f eight, um, 4K, 8K, uh, sharper television, lots of people say you don't need it, but you don't understand if television screens become flatter and larger, but apartments don't. You sit closer to the pixels, the pixels have to be closer to each other, you need 4K, 8K. In the most recent uh, uh, Las Vegas convention for consumer electronics, um, the, uh, there were, I think, like 11 companies of which four or six were from China demonstrating this as consumer products. Netflix has already now, is offering with Cablevision, an American cable company, uh, 4K um, over the uh, online. Then, you, so you have sharper pictures, much sharper pictures. You also have, of course, um, 3D, three-dimensional. Uh, you have person-to-person um, -person interactivity, such as pioneered by games in which hundreds and thousands of people communicate with each other. You have augmented reality in which computer-generated reality interacts with real reality. You got user-based uh, content, user-generated content together with video participation so that now you have the ability to actually sportscast, be your own sportscaster to your group of friends, such as pioneered by Amigo TV. 
you got virtual worlds in which you, an avatar, just like you, except better looking probably, is, is uh, interacting with the outside world, with other participants. You got a immersive type cameras which give you 360 and you can then kind of select the view that you would like to see. You got personalization of content uh, such as the one here. Uh, you got a globalized television. You got personalized uh, content. MIT Media Lab has been doing this and touting this as kind of like the new thing. Now I discover that actually your dean here, Noam, has actually done this about 40 years ago uh, in the same institution, MIT. So they have reinvented reality. Uh, and there's, of course, a lot more. And together, this creates a television that is a television of immersion, of participation, in which you can see yourself in the action, three-dimensional. You can turn. You can almost participate. You hear the chants. Uh, it's kind of a very... Uh, deep experience, not just a multiple experience. And so there's a lot more that you can do to put these things together. You can participate in sports. Uh, you can use it as a marketing tool. You can use it as an experience tool in documentaries. Uh, you can tag along to Mount Everest to the peak for a fee, of course, uh, and experience that, that uh, uh, adventure. And so now, so this is, these are the technology elements, but technology elements as important as they are, and I'm sure that many people right here in Herzliya know about them, develop them, participate in them, but that's only part of it because the interesting thing is what kind of industry is emerging based on that? And so who are going to be the central players? And it is my contention that the central players will be companies that we can call clouds, media clouds. And those clouds consist of companies such, uh, such as, let's see, show you here how, kind of how pervasive this has become. In the United States, in the early evening hours, approximately 60% of internet traffic today is video, yes? uh, of which about half uh, is accounted for by one company, Netflix. Okay, now 60%, three or four years ago, there was almost, there was just five or so percent. So the growth rate is enormous and there's no way for it to stop. In a few years, I would predict kind of 98% of internet traffic in bit terms will actually be video bits. Now, who are the central companies in there? Those are companies that are well known to you. There would be kind of a Google. This would be kind of the media company of the future or here or Apple, uh, media, the media company of the future, the central nodes of the media environment, and there's more, except I don't have the time. And so the question is, why would they become strong and dominant? What are the factors? And the factors basically are, sorry, are uh, about eight or so, and I will kind of go through at least some of them briefly. The first one is the diversity of options. What do I mean by that? Old television was pretty uniform. It was controlled by the intermediate pipes. They controlled what went in, and they controlled basically the standards. And so television was a very low technology innovation type industry. Uh, what is the opposite of Moore's law? That's what television was. And I will call this uh, in reference to David Sarnoff, who was the pioneer of radio and television with the RCA. I would call this Sarnoff's law, which basically is that you have a 4% growth rate, um, and you have a 4% growth rate, a 2% growth rate per year in terms of technical innovation, not a 40%. Um, and, and that led to one generation approximately every 30 years. But the interesting thing, of course, now is that all these technology pieces that I showed you are developed by multiple companies in a very dynamic process. So how do you bring them together? Well, you can try to organize some, some, something here, but basically uh, intermediary institutions that we now call clouds, but basically intermediaries are the ones who are at the center who can bring together these various technology elements and components and kind of integrate them. You'll have a media system that consists of two levels. There's the integrator level and there's the specialist level. And the specialist level is hardware and software and content and different contents. And then there are the integrators. And the central integrators are those particular cloud companies. So that's factor number one. Factor number two is, factor number two 
is our standards. Okay, standards, is, it's a similar situation. If you want to interconnect and interoperate, there are several options. One of them is you standardize. That's the old model. It has worked really poorly in the past, and there's no way that it will work in the future. So much better, much easier is to have an intermediary institution into which multiple companies with multiple technology solutions can connect, and the cloud itself will do the interoperation and will have a single connectivity then to the end user. And that gets me to the third factor, which is convenience. It is true that uh, on the end user level, you could be the integrator of different technology solutions, but you know yourself from home networks how complicated and frustrating it, be it can become even to connect an Apple solution with a PC solution, with a television solution. It takes expertise and a lot of patience. <coughs> Uh, much better to have somebody in the back, in the cloud, do that integration for you. And a fourth factor is law and regulation. You see, different countries have their own approaches to content. And it's just a reality. Saudi Arabia is different from Israel, fortunately. Um, and or maybe the other way around. And, and Russia and China and the United States, different solutions. There's a simply no way, realistically, to have the same approach to content. Now, content providers can try to, on their own, conform to the rules of 200 countries. It is a very complicated process. Much easier to have an intermediary, in effect, vet the content for all these countries. So the intermediary, in effect, becomes the enforcer, the coordinator of different countries' uh, content standards. Now, I could go on on the various other reasons why like marketing, like security, like branding, and so on, why clouds will have the advantage because there has to be intermediaries in this kind of a system. And so in the end, the media company of the future is a cloud. All right, now, but there's not only one cloud, there are clouds in the plural. So the system becomes, in effect, a cloud of clouds because they have somehow to interoperate. And that brings me to the policy issues here, the policy issues of the fourth generation of television. Now, many of these policy issues will be good old friends. We've seen them before just in new guises. There will be some new ones, but many of them are just a next generation of the same problems, such as how to bring inclusion to poor people, such as how to deal with the digitally uh, challenged generations, how to deal with global content that will move in particular from the United States to the rest of the world, how to deal with violence and children and sex and so on. Um, and then, uh, of course, consumer protection, how you prevent people from Nigeria, pray, say, or other countries to prey on innocent bystanders, uh, privacy and so on. So these are all, we understand some of these issues pretty well. They just have to be applied in different ways. But I think kind of a really interesting issue here is market power. Again, old friends, cloud services, intermediary services have technology challenge, high capital costs, low marginal costs, lots of, uh, of network externalities, all of the ingredients that will lead to economies of scale of enormous kind, the kind of economies of scale that Google has and Google enjoys, uh, and that means that there will be a few, a handful maybe, of really serious cloud providers in the world, and therefore there will be market power. Market power has problems by itself, but there is also the other problem, which is how to interconnect between those clouds that I showed you. All right, sorry how to interconnect between those clouds, because if you don't have some form of interconnection and operability, you probably have a consumer lock-in. Uh, if those of you who have an iPhone, uh, you, you understand the issue, which is there is a system iPhone and there's an Android and there's this and that, and they don't really kind of connect very well with each other, even where you have an intermediary called a phone company. And, and so this would be the same problem on steroids. And so the question then is how you do the interconnection, and there's several, sorry, there's several, several ways to do that. Uh, for reasons of time, I can't. There's self-connectivity, 
by users, difficult, complicated. There is a peer-to-peer, peer-type connectivity uh, then that would also have problems by leaving some participants out in this particular case, cloud number C. And then you have an intercloud, a cloud of clouds into which everybody connects. That can be voluntarily preferable. It could be regulated, less preferable, but there are other possibilities too. And for reasons of time, I cannot um, go into them except just to give you the bottom line. By my analysis, all you need are two rules that will make this system of cloud of clouds into operating. One rule is that you have to unbundle so that you can take some services of the clouds, but not necessarily all. And the second rule is uh, that while you don't have to do anything if you are a private system outside of the public internet, but if you're connected to the public internet, you also have to give two-way connectivity. Your users can go from the cloud to other providers. I wish I would have a bit more time to develop that, um, but my stern moderators are basically uh, breathing down my neck here. So to conclude then, I would say, um, summary here is uh, the central institutions of media in the future based on these elements that I've described to you will be intermediaries called clouds. That there is, there are kind of enormous technological advances kind of flowing from such an arrangement and television will move from the speed of um, Sarnoff's law, the 2% that I described, to a much more Moore's law type, type of technological pace that will have not only technological impact, but also on content, on culture, on political communications, on civilization. It cannot be overstressed how fundamental this change is. But the issue of market power is one that has to be resolved and can be resolved. I try to uh, give you a little bit of a sense of where it is going. But now with time passing, I will kind of say thank you very much. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Carl Fremont, and I'm the chief digital officer at a company called MEC, which is part of the WPP group of companies, media companies. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but basically the global ad industry is made up of about five holding groups, which WPP is one of them. Another one is uh, Pulis's group where I worked before. So I'm responsible for the digital media across all of our offices. And I'm very happy to be here. Let me just say, Ani Maod Sameach Liot Ka'an. That's about the extent of my Hebrew. I don't think you want to hear the rest of my third grade uh, Bar Mitzvah Hebrew. Uh, but I'm very happy to be here at the conference and in Israel. Um, digital media, as you probably know, is exploding. It's huge. In the US, it accounts for about $40 billion estimated in 2013, which represents about a little less than 10% of the uh, US advertising. The display media, which is both on mobile and on PC, represents about $17 billion of that industry, which is about an 18% year-over-year growth, which is also huge and growing very much. Um, but the market size of that is very complex and very hard to manage. Um, overall, there are over 650 million websites that we deal with, and there are over 1 trillion web pages, 5.3 trillion impressions that are served every day. It's a very complex system. Um, even though it's growing uh, very large, we need to figure out ways to make it much more efficient and to drive revenue from it even more. It's a very still tedious buying and selling process um, for online. Overall, for a publisher, it represents every time they get an insertion order, an order for a media buy, it costs them an, on average $40,000 between the sales calls and all the operations. On the media side, it costs an agency about 30 cents on the dollar to administrate that. Very tedious and very expensive and we needed to figure out a way in which to make it less tedious and mo much more efficient 
and allow even smaller advertisers and smaller marketers to get into that space. Today, media buying um, and selling are basically two parts. You've got the guaranteed inventory, so you're buying on a website or on a mobile site at a guaranteed uh, price and a guaranteed positioning, um, and then the remnant inventory, which is everything that's unsold. And that's really what is kind of the secret in the industry about the infinite number of unsold impressions, unsold inventory that there is out there. But again, a very tedious process. What the sellers want, those that are selling advertising, they want monetization, obviously. They want to grow. Um, they need sales predicti predictability. They need to be able to determine when their sales are going to come in, what cycle, at what period of time. Very hard to forecast. They need operational efficiencies. Again, on average, about $40,000 per insertion for every time an ad runs, it costs them. So very expensive. And they've got two sets of sales forces. They've got a direct sales force um, that is selling online and on the internet, and an indirect one that's selling on offline platforms. So if you're a publisher, a print publisher, a magazine publisher, today you have two sets of sales teams. In television, two sets of sales teams. One that sells direct um, and online, and the other one that sells all the other offline media. Again, a very tedious and expensive proposition. What the buyers, and that's what I represent, the buyers of the media, we need operational efficiency. It takes too long and too many people to buy, to plan and to buy the media. We need better targeting of, our, of who we're, uh, we're reaching. Um, there's a lot of waste of impressions in the system today of people who are not in our target audience. So we're looking for better targeting and better control flexibility in our pricing so that we can control the pricing based on the market dynamics of how the markets are moving in real time. Today we set the pricing is very much so set before we advertise and in a real time bidding operation which is like a Google it allows us to control the pricing and we set the pricing. And then a holistic solution one that includes all platforms online, offline, all together on a tablet, on a mobile device. We want to be able to buy it across multiple screens and of course, better ROI for what we are doing. So we have a lot of goals and a lot of demands. Automation, which is the programmatic side of this, aids in this and that's where the industry has evolved to. And as we know, that um, automation has impacted greatly the finance industry, the travel industry and the e-com industry have all benefited from automation, from bringing buyers and sellers much closer together. So now we need to do that in the media community. One group of companies, which is not surprising, really has been on the forefront of that automation, and that's Google. So while there are many companies in the space, Google really has developed across the entire ecosystem. So DoubleClick is their ad exchange. That's the platform in which we buy in real time, in real time bidding. Um, AdMeld is a company that they just bought, um, and that's a supply side publish platform. So that tells publishers how much of their inventory are they allowed to sell. And then Invite Media, another purchase of theirs, is the demand side platform. That allows the buyers to trade in real time and understand what inventory is available. So Google has really cornered the market in that whole ecosystem today. Um, but there are other players in, the, in this space, Pubmatic, iSpock, iSocket, Legolos, which is actually an Israeli-based company right here in Ramat Gan, Rubicon, Shiny Ads. Um, Shiny Ads and iSocket are more for smaller time players but these are some of the leading companies in this whole ecosystem of exchanges, supply side platforms, and then the demand side platforms. So programmatic media, which is at the intersection of media, technology, and data, is really what brings that all together in a real time manner, in real time bidding, in a similar way in which we buy in Google. The other thing that's coming is, is private marketplaces. So we're not just buying on the open exchange, but we're building a group of publishers, of media companies that we want to purchase, 
and we're building an exchange within them. So a group of media companies are allowing their inventory to be made and traded in real time. You don't know where your ads are gonna run in that private marketplace specifically, but you'll know which publishers are in that private marketplace. So there's a little bit more control over it. So th this is basically programmatic uh, marketing and includes the publisher inventory, a sell side platform, like I said, like an ad meld, a um, DSP or demand side publisher, a platform like a Rubicom, um, and then the advertisers. This is what's been created for us, the buyers and the sellers, in order to automate this system, which has been very tedious and allows us to move forward in, in real time. RTB, or real-time bidding, has grown tremendously. By this year, it will grow 73% year over year, and by 2017, account for about 30% um, of all display advertising will be done in a real-time programmatic basis. The way in which we do it on the left is contextual targeting. That's the way it's traditionally done, that we buy based on the profile of that media site uh, based on the content and where we are moving much more in that programmatic is audience buying. So we're buying not just publishers, but we're buying audiences in them, demographics within it. The way it's created is we profile through a lot of first party data, third party data. My company's trading desk is called Zaxis. It's what we created and that's the liaison, that's the go between the trading desk and the uh, demand side platforms and the exchanges. The data though drives that audience selectivity and there are four components to it. We look at prior campaign uh, data, we look at customer uh, data, we look at brand, any kind of brand research and audience behavior, demographics, um, econometrics, financials. That paints a picture of who our audience is, who we're targeting, and we buy that audience as opposed to buying on a publisher basis. So the data then is modeled uh, based on all those attributes, and then we look at what is the value of that audience, and that is what we use as our benchmarks for real-time bidding. Here are two examples, very quickly, um, that we've used at our trading desk, Zaxis. The first is a financial services company that wanted to raise awareness and drive deeper engagement beyond just the landing page. So we created an audience portrait of likely consumers, who they were, based on all that audience data. And what you can see, the baseline on the left, and then the lift that was provided in engagement and response from our Zaxis, our trading desk, was three and a half times greater engagement than if we were buying based on uh, particular publications. And when we bought it on a specific um, channel, radio, we had an even greater left. I don't know what's going on here. It's, anybody know what's going on? Stop the clock. I get an extra couple minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so the second case is a consumer packaged goods company. They wanted to drive online and offline sales among a demographic audience. And you can see when we bought it in the exchange, in the real time, we achieved a 178% uh, lift in ROI. The way in which publishers can monetize this, the big question is this, good for publishers or not? Um, well, they may get a fixed CPM, cost per thousand, of let's say $5. In real-time bidding, we set it, but that's inventory that would have gone unsold that they would not have monetized. So there's a uh, great opportunity. What's next in this is, as I said before, premium exchanges where we're selecting the group of publishers that we want to buy on, using real-time bidding for mobile and for video, for television, radio, and out of home, which traditionally has not been used in real-time bidding. The one thing that we have to watch out for is cookie deletion, because then that really screws up our audience targeting capability. 
not there yet, but it's something that we have to watch out for. So, in my opinion, is programmatic, automated, real-time bidding a friend of publishers or not? I say it is. Toda raba. Wow. Uh, Carl didn't have time to mention it, but uh, there's a Jerusalem Post article in which uh, the real-time bidding next stage is real-time marketing. And at uh, Carl's previous company, they did a real-time Oreo campaign, AT&T at his current uh, company, also real-time marketing, instantaneous marketing. So find Carl during the uh, coffee break. He talked about cookie deletion. We're going to do cookie inclusion after this panel. But first, we want to hear from Dan Marone. Thank you. Hi, Dan. My, our next speaker is Dan Marone. And he's in. morning. I think I can handle it. Maybe. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the kind invitation. It's my first time in a media conference, so I'm the new guy on the block. I hope you'll enjoy the next nine and a half minutes. I will talk about crowdfunding. I will start with a short story that I hope will illustrate my point, uh, continue with introducing myself, the concept, and maybe providing some insights about the potential of crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is essentially the ability to raise small funds from a large amount of investors or micro investors to help uh, entrepreneurs. Um, and I, I, I would like to start, maybe we'll see it better like that. Sorry, let's, tw 20 years from now ago, uh, two companies were competing. One of them was a very big company, investing more than $50 million in conquering a very interesting market. The second was a company based upon volunteers. A group of volunteers created the data, the content, and also contributed the money, the funds. They wanted to conquer, both of them wanted to conquer the encyclopedia market, which was very big 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago. The first was Microsoft. They invested more than $50 million in Encarta, which was shut down after three years. The second is Wikipedia. I guess that if, you, if I would ask you whether you would invest $100 in each one of the companies, you would choose the first one. The first was seized of operation. The second is maybe the, the most successful crowd-empowered organization. My argument is that crowd-empowered organizations will rule the financial world and the content in, in a few years, and I think we have evidences. In the next eight minutes, I will speak about a, 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 an option to crowdfund um, financing of a venture. So I'm Dan Marom. I'm a researcher from the Hebrew University. And uh, I, th three years ago, my claim to fame is that I co-authored a book with a very nice guy called Kevin Lawton. Uh, this is the, f the second edition. A remark about co-creation we haven't met yet. We co-authored the book um, without seeing each other, only with Skype. He's a great guy, a good friend of mine. Uh, usually, the, the audience laughs at this point, but <laughs> I guess it's only f because I'm, I'm funny, but uh, okay, <laughs> never mind. So, crowdfunding, the ability to raise funds, relatively small amount of funds from a large audience. Uh, we didn't invent crowdfunding a few years ago. It was invented ages ago. We have uh, evidences of ancient I Indian ways of uh, crowdfunding, 250, year, 100 years 200 years ago, the Statue of Liberty was crowdfunding using a very traditional media channel uh, by Pulitzer. Uh, you, you are well familiar with Pulitzer, who was, he was a publisher of a very big American newspaper, and he helped to crowdfund the Statue of Liberty. It's a nice story. Technology, um, social networks, internet has enabled the easy transfer of money and information. And therefore, crowdfunding has been enabled at a larger scale. Um, there are, it, it, crowdfunding is essentially 
a way to introduce entrepreneurs who would like to fund their ventures with potential micro investors. The usual way to do it currently is uh, imagine an eBay for ideas where you introduce entrepreneurs to investors. There are more than 500 such as eBay's crowdfunding platforms that enables entrepreneurs to crowdfund their ideas. And in 2000, last year, it was almost $3 billion market. It has grown dramatically over the last few years. And the next year, it's supposed to be even bigger. I'm, I'm doing the quick paced uh, presentation. All, the, all my slides will be available. At the, so if you need any other information, I will be gladly to provide it. So, how crowdfunding works? It's essentially divided by the return on investment. There are four models currently. The first is donation, just done by internet, by uh, virtual media. The second is a reward base. You can pre-purchase. I want to invent this thing. I will pitch it to you, and you, you will be able to pre-buy it um, and help me uh, do this adventure. There are lending and equity base, which uh, I'll speak in a different conference. Uh, everyone, uh, I, I guess that uh, some of you are aware of Kickstarter. Who has heard Kickstarter? Yeah, great. So Kickstarter is one of the biggest reward-based crowdfunding platforms. It enables entrepreneurs um, to introduce their, their story, like the, the, this is a, a screenshot from yesterday. And they offer the crowd an opportunity to pre-buy their dream and support them in their adventure. Uh, there's a, a, the, the most interesting story is an entrepreneur from the Silicon Valley who is a, an avid bicycle rider. He wanted to uh, read the SMS and to see who's calling him without stopping by the way. He pitched 24 uh, VCs on Sand Hill Roads on the Silicon Valley and was re rejected by all of them. He uploaded the, the Pebble Watch um, and 70,000 people ordered his watch before it was produced, before it was uh, made. So he gathered more than $11 uh, million dollars and approximately two weeks ago he raised a sequential funding round of more than 15 hundred uh, million dollar. It's a very, very big case study. Most of the campaigns, you, you, you saw that there are more than one million campaigns. Most of them are relatively small. It's just to illustrate the potential of crowdfunding. Um, I want to show a short video about Kickstarter for journalism. Let's see if it will work. It should work. Uh, there are, as I've said, there are more than 500 platforms currently. Some of them are targeting niche markets. Um, some of them are targeting media entrepreneurs, like maybe some of you. And one of them, a very promising one, is called Vurno. And you'll see it in a minute.
sorry. Do you have a keyboard here? Oh, it would be better. So I'm not affiliated with Vono, but I just wanted to illustrate the potential of, of crowdfunding also to different industries like the media one. Uh, Spot.us is another Kickstarter for reporters. We have also for visual journalism. Uh, a, a short anecdote, uh, three months ago, a Netherlands-based blog uh, has asked 15,000 people to pre-order a 60 euro yearly subscription uh, with a very, very interesting manifesto concentrating from news to new, and uh, he raised more than one and a three, $1.3 million in two weeks. So, crowdfunding has emerged as a, an alternative for uh, funding new ideas and ventures. I hope that I, I was able to convince you that there is potential here. I see it as the new like, because like currently is passive, um, and, and even if we were, were able to um, get five dollars from for Obama campaign, which was one of the largest crowdfunding campaigns. He's engaged. He's truly engaged. He will tell his family, and he will come to vote. So, without further ado, uh, crowdfunding. I see it as a, as an opportunity, maybe even to democratize media. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thanks. So while Jovev is getting set up, I just want to remind everybody, if you want to tweet, uh, it's hashtag TMConf, hashtag TMCONF. All of the uh, video is going to be on the website. Uh, I think we have a whole team of uh, ambitious, enthusiastic students who are actually tweeting and live blogging as we speak. Uh, so going from the altruistic uh, crowdfunding to the less than altruistic um, pay TV operator perspective, Jovev? Okay, hi everybody, my name is Dovev Goldstein. Uh, in the past few years I teach here in this school of uh, communication. It's a great pleasure, so it's a great opportunity to thank Noam, uh, Or and, uh, and the IDC team for this uh, great pleasure. On my day job I lead uh, the business and product development at a company called Yes. It's a satellite TV operator. Can you hear me? Um, it's the Israeli satellite TV operator. And uh, in the next few minutes, I would like to present with you uh, to present you uh, the case study of the future of TV. It's not the far future; it's the very near future. Actually, we've introduced this product just five days ago, uh, and to share with you our vision about the way that uh, media companies uh, change uh, thanks to the new uh, technological uh, uh, capabilities that, that are there, and uh, I hope that it's going to be uh, the basis for, uh, for the next dis the discussion in the next uh, panel. So just a brief about YES, uh, we have uh, approximately 600,000 households, uh, subscriber, 40% market share, uh, and uh, as part of uh, the company's DNA, we have uh, uh, we've introduced, we, we have innovation as part of the, our uh, values for our company. So since our, the involvement of the company uh, 13 years ago, uh, whenever there was technology that was available, we were the first to introduce it to the market. Many of those uh, introductions like uh, remote booking and uh, streamer and so on, we are the only ones in the market to offer this uh, to our subscribers. All of those innovation uh, campaigns and innovation in the company uh, leads to uh, the next uh, 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 graph that you can see. We, have, we are perceived by our consumers, but actually by the Israeli consumers, the most innovative companies uh, uh, in the TV, the most in innovative company in the Israeli uh, multi-channel uh, multi TV industry. Uh, you can see here the graph of, uh, uh, just to build the basis for the next, uh, uh, the next, the future of TV, I would like to share with you some figures. Uh, this is the PVR penetration within our, uh, within our consumer base, over 70% penetration. And the next generation of TV is made of uh, three elements. One, the first one is the personal TV, personalization of the TV. As you all know, TV is a broadcast medium, uh, and we've changed uh, the way that we uh, work with our uh, database into the next phase of TV, the next phase which is going to be personalized uh, television. 
The second one is a new user experience. Uh, we have uh, we've completely changed the way that our consumers consume TV through their set box. Actually, it's uh, available on their current set boxes that are there in, already installed in their uh, households. Uh, but they have completely new user experience, completely new uh, user inter interface, and so on. The third one is the multi-room, the, the ability to take their content from their PVR, their recorded uh, content on uh, one set box, which is normally in the living room, and take it into the other rooms in the, in the household. So I'm going to show you a little bit about how it looks. Well, personalization. With we are about to introduce MyTV. It's a, a recommendation system actually operated by uh, Viaxis Oka, which we have represent uh, representatives over there is here. Uh, it's a recommendation system. It analyzes the consumption of media within our platform, and then it offers on demand to the user a uh, recommendation that are based on his own personal taste, personal uh, experience, of course, adjusted to time slots. We, uh, we normally consume different time of, type of content during uh, noon hours, uh, opposed to uh, uh, evening hours, and so, and so on. So this is uh, an example of the recommendation system. We have, of course, a very advanced search engine where you can search on uh, content from our VOD platform, from the PVR, whatever you've recorded, and of course from the, uh, the live channels, so you can search for whatever you want, and an edited uh, uh, recommendations from our editorial team. We can see say, uh, some of the, uh, the insights. We, we make lots of research uh, with our consumers, and uh, not only that we go abroad to see what's available in terms of uh, uh, what's uh, available in terms of technology. We also ask people, what do, we, what do you want from your TV? What's going to be the, the best experience that you would like to, uh, to get from a multi-channel TV operator? Most of them tell us, okay, I love the PVR. I love the, the option to record uh, stuff, but I would like to take it from my living room and to continue watch it uh, on my, uh, in my bedroom. I don't want to be... Uh, obliged to uh, stay in front of the set of box where I've recorded the show and continue wat watching it uh, on the same set of box. I would like to take it wor to wherever I want. We can see here, on, next to that, we can see, which is um, presented here in the pink uh, line, live uh, uh, rating is uh, uh, added by at least 20% uh, additional rating thanks to recorded shows, so, which means that many people, well, 20% of our consumption of uh, PVR uh, is uh, added with recorded shows, with the recorded content. So some, some figures that uh, I think would uh, uh, be interesting for you guys, as you can uh, imagine, not all recorded shows are similar. We, d we probably want to, so, is to watch some content as recorded shows, while other types of content we'd like, we prefer to, show, to watch it uh, live. So half of our uh, uh, series channels uh, rating is postponed to time shifting. We can see here the differences between the different types of content. As you can see, news and sports, which, are, which is not surprisingly mostly watched uh, as live, while the series uh, channels are mostly watched, uh, or 46 percent of it are being watched as uh, recorded shows where our consumers watch it whenever it's convenient for them. We also see that uh, the time shifted uh, type of experience is uh, uh, also enhanced through VOD consumption. We can see the growth of VOD consumption uh, is also is going on the same trend as uh, the recorded shows. There is a recorded show. The recorded content. Sorry. Uh, so, multi-room. Multi-room is the ability to watch whatever you want on the whatever you recorded on your PVR on all the set of boxes of the household. You can also stop watching in one one room and continue and resume from the same spot on other set of boxes on the, in the house. So this is how it works. I'll skip on that. I'll go to the experience, the way, the new UI that we have uh, uh, we've introduced. Just uh, for those of you who aren't familiar about the UI of Yes, this was, until five days ago, the user experience of uh, Yes consumers. Uh, you can see here, the very, uh, it's a, a legacy type of uh, user experience where you have the EPG and so on. Another screen is uh, like the main menu where you have uh, all the different functions on the right upper side and a very short, small video 
on the lower uh, side of the, of the screen. And I would like to show you uh, the new user experience that we've just introduced. Okay, so, so this is, uh, can, can we turn on the light here so it would be more visually uh, seen? I do it from here. Thank you. Number one. Uh, so, uh, this is the new user experience. It's, uh, it's, it can be downloaded automatically by the users. It can be downloaded to his set box or his or hers uh, set box automatically. We can see here the difference in the concept of the user experience. We understand that our users are interested, first of all, and above everything, they are interested in content. Uh, and we uh, take the, uh, they uh, give us the privilege to enter into the screen only on demand. So while they ask for some information about the type of uh, in, uh, the synopsis or the type of uh, program that are being aired there, out there, I, okay. Uh, only upon request, we enter into the uh, into their screen. You can you can also see the sp uh, the speed of the interface, the way that uh, yeah, it's a great demo of speed. Uh, the way that the set box works, speed is a crucial element in the the whole experience of the users, uh, and. We cannot see it very uh, easily from here. We have the, uh, the video as a full screen on the, in the back. Uh, we also, we, you can also see that the menu is the uh, same type of menu, menu as we all know from uh, smartphones, uh, tablets, and so on, which is un unlike the, uh, the menu that we all knew as uh, open a menu uh, page, we have a, a very a horizontal menu, which is uh, half transparent on top of the video. Something that we all we are all familiar from uh, experiences uh, of uh, innovative companies uh, such as TV and many many others. Uh, so I hope this uh, emphasizes the way that uh, we, as a multi multi-channel TV operator, tries to um, to enhance the abilities of technology and to provide this technology and offer it to the consumers and to the mass uh, production consumers, to the mass of consumers. And uh, hope, hopefully it would enable uh, some uh, talks uh, during Darnef's panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ellie, right, we're gonna do the panel now. So uh, I'd like to invite our panelists to come up. Now it's your chance to ask questions. If you have easy questions, I can tell you where the bathroom is, where the coffee is, because we're going to have that in 15 minutes. If you have hard questions, save it for our, our experts. Uh, Darcy is going to moderate your questions, and uh, I'll let Darcy take it away. So this was a very diverse group of presentations. Uh, it's not clear to me that uh, one would want to address one question to all the speakers. So if you have individual questions for individual speakers, uh, please say who your question is for and then your question. So do we have some questions? No questions? Martin, uh, do we have the uh, phone? Do we have the microphone? Here's the, here's the microphone. Martin. We're going to do the Oprah. And just say your name and where you're from, please. <clears throat> My name is Martin Elton. I'm not from any particular company <clears throat> at the moment. Um, I'd like to ask Dan Marom how he thinks Vorno is going to solve the problem he mentioned of uh, quality standards in journalism. Is it working? Yes. Thanks for the question. Uh, I'm not affiliated with, with this platform. It was only an example. I, th I, I am a true believer in the wisdom of crowd. Um, I'm not sure that it's related to quality as you see it, but I think that uh, integrating the wisdom of crowd, crowdsourcing of ideas, and bringing an opportunity for creators across the globe to enter this market, I believe that I, I've seen it in other industries. It will help this industry, but as I've said earlier, I'm not an expert, so please excuse me if I'm 
I see it otherwise. But I have an expert here. No, I'm not an expert, but I kind of I'm really fascinated as a finance professor myself. I'm, of course, glad that uh, greater efficiency is brought to the market, but I have to add a skeptical note, which is uh, there's a reason why there are security regulations around the world, because there are bad people, not only wise crowds, but also bad people who are trying to beat the system. Always have been, always will be. And so, so they, what is it? particularly with the anonymity of the internet, what prevents consumer fraud on an organized scale to emerge? How can you prevent that? How does the crowd have that wisdom to kind of beat those odds? I can answer that. That's a, a simple question, but uh, I, leave, I leave the question for the crowd. No, go ahead, answer it. Be my okay. guest. So fraud is a major concern in crowdfunding, as you can imagine. Uh, protecting small investors is the work of uh, security agencies across the world. There is a, a, a tension between unleashing the potential of small investors um, to help small uh, SMEs, to help SMEs um, to fund themselves in various industries. And the fraud concern is, as I've said, a major one. There are inherent social um, issues that helps preventing fraud, that there are some uh, rules that should be made by the authorities but I see it a bit differently because I think that uh, unleashing the potential of crowdfunding and enabling entrepreneurs uh, is, a bigger, uh, is a big opportunity for many countries and we should not be such a pat uh, patronage or, or of small investors. Uh, we wrote it our book that no one can stop someone from taking 100K dollars, put them in a suitcase and go to Vegas. Uh, I'm not arguing that that's the case for crowdfunding, but I think that we should let the crowd decide. You want to argue? We can start. <laughs> Do we have another question? Yes. Good. Hi, it's uh, to uh, Dovet Goldstein. Hi, name my name's way. Katie Denton. I'm from Cody Media. Uh, I just wanted to understand a bit more about um, how your multi-room. You didn't kind of explain or maybe I missed it, that like, if you're watching something on the TV with the set-top box and you move to a different room, how does it work technology-wise if you move to a different room? Um, I hope I'm good. Does it work? Yeah, it does. Uh, I'll try to uh, brief, uh, briefly explain the, the way that it works. So, uh, on our, uh, the household is uh, uh, managed uh, on our head end, so we know which set of boxes are related to one, uh, one household. Also, uh, uh, physically, we have all our set of boxes connected to the dish, because we are a satellite company. So anyway, we have uh, a network, an in-house network uh, that uh, connects all the set of boxes in the house. We connect this uh, uh, network into the internet, uh, so our VOD, for instance, is over the top. Uh, so for the uh, bi-directional uh, uh, type of communication, we have the internet it's a hybrid uh, connection to the set of boxes, and thanks to that, we enable, uh, 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 in terms of D uh, uh, DRM, we enable uh, other set of boxes enter the hard drive actually of the, uh, the so set of box. box. Yeah, you need another set of box. You need a, a, a simple HD set of box in the other in all the other rooms. Okay, is there another question? Way up there. Good. Hand it to someone, they'll pass it up. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Oren Yaffe. I'm uh, no, out of no particular company. The question is uh, directed at Yael Givon. Um, I'd like to understand better the, um, what you're actually proposing with Stevie with regards to taking nonlinear content and repackaging it into uh, linear content again. Uh, could you please explain uh, in further detail? Um, the, actually, the, the question of uh, linear and time shifted, and I'm actually uh, happy to see um, Dovev and, and what Yes is doing in terms of of pushing the time shifting. I think um, where we come from is um, we don't want to push the time shifting 
too much, or, or, or rather say there are uh, many situations where time shifting and, and online video, like, like you say, are, are, um, are great for consumption, you know, one by one, I just want to watch this video, or my friend just shared this video, and I'm, I'm going to watch it with them. Um, that said, uh, most of the curation, and uh, obviously the, the crowdsourced curation, is happening on social media right now. And um, people going down their feeds are, are looking at, at textual entries. A lot of people are missing a lot of the video that's, that's shared on, on uh, social feeds, and missing a lot of the context around these videos. Um, we, and, and this is from our personal taste, we come from um, actually loving linear TV and loving the lean back experience and uh, loving to, to zap and being surprised by, by curation. Um, so, and it could, it, it's curation that now happens in media companies headquarters and um, repackaging that video. And it's not, you know, it's not to say this is instead of Facebook or this is instead of uh, watching, you know, single videos from YouTube on your phone. Um, but there are situations, and, and background TV is sort of a, um, a big niche in news and sports and, and um, nature channels. There are a lot of, of, of or music channels, a lot of uh, uh, types of background TV. And we feel this is a sort of background TV that, first of all, can be much more meaningful for you and, and um, help you delve into... Uh, premium content that you're actually going to watch time shifted, but it's going to be presented and um, and curated by um, by friends. I Can I uh, ask you just one more question with regards to the actual scheduling of such a uh, such a platform? You are actually uh, you have the, the the power to actually uh, decide where the, the premium content give it some more. Uh, um, some more uh, credence, some more uh, uh, more importance. And uh, in, this, in this relation, how, how do you uh, pr provide the, the, the user with some kind of an assurance that it's not going to be simply uh, shifting premium content instead of uh, providing a personal experience? Um, this is um, this is sort of a deep kind of product question. I don't know if. Uh, uh, we want to bore everyone with that, but just a, a, a point, I think, um, and, and yes, again, are, are a good example. The way um, the personal recommendations come up in, um, in your platform right now uh, have to do with uh, media, my media consumption, the, right? The, the what I've watched before and what Netflix is doing a lot of this too. Um, if you put in the social uh, component in that as well, then you just sort of creating a bigger um, a bigger source and, and we think a meaningful source uh, for those recommendations. Um, so without that mix, we're, we're just another premium platform. So I think that's uh, sort of going to keep us in line. Thank you. Thank Next you. questions over here. Hi, Michal Shaw from the Hebrew University. Uh, this question is for Dan Marom. Um, do you envision that um, in the long run, Crowdfunding may replace um, the traditional role of um, media intermediaries like Hollywood studios, the major record labels, in um, uh, investing in creative content. Thanks. I, I, I see it as a compliment. I, I, I pitch audiences with the provocative ideas. I try to do it uh, and sell books by saying it will diminish the old economy, but um, I'm kidding. I'm so, uh, I think it will be complementary to classic funding models. I see it on the entrepreneurial finance as well. The, the question about uh, crowdfunding currently is scale, and we could not scale up without the help of uh, super angels, VCs, private equity, etc. And the same, I think, the same will be with the media industry, although I'm not uh, f very familiar with the key issues there. I think that uh, gaining scalability will be with the classical players, but they will change. Maybe they will validate their investments by leveraging the power of the crowd. Maybe they will be able to double or triple the budget with the crowd. So that's essentially um, my thoughts. Another question. Can I just answer that? Sure. Uh, kind of try to address that too. There are two kinds of crowd crowdfunding. One is kind of the charitable type, the Obama type financing. The other one is kind of people who are trying to make a profit. 
uh, from their investment. Uh, now, uh, when you fund only one project, you are at a much higher risk. And in the case of film, you are at an extremely high risk. The secret for the Hollywood financing is that they, can, they have portfolios. And in portfolios, as you know from portfolio theory, you can, can reduce the overall risk uh, in a systematic way. And so that's the advantage of Hollywood financing. That will not go away in crowd financing. So they will, st unless the crowd financing covers a whole slate of films, 10 films, 12 films, 20 films. And unless you have that, it's still going to be a higher cost of capital. Yeah. Hi, I'm Daniel Barnett from the Mandela Foundation. A number of the solutions you were speaking about, or the platforms you were speaking about, were based on being able to monitor customer behavior, or user behavior in some way. Carl, you even spoke about cookie disable as putting a spanner in the works. I wondered if you had any thoughts to the panel as a whole about the revelations over the last few days about the, or the accusations that the NSA has had direct access to servers of some of our big companies and whether that kind of uh, threat to uh, customer confidence is something that we're going to see more and more of or is there some way that in the private sector you feel that you can insulate against that kind of thing? Um, it, is, it is a big concern. Um, we monitor that on an ongoing basis. I believe the answer to that is self-regulation. So the industry, the ad industry needs to self-regulate itself and we are. So the ad council we have right now placement on each ad that says that they're compliant. So we make sure that our clients are being very compliant and follow the standards that are set in the industry of how data is collected. It's um, following opt-in rules. But that said, it is critical moving forward that we use cookie data, that we use identifiable information about your behaviors in order to target. So I believe that through self-regulation, we'll be able to help that industry move forward. Thank you. I think that's all our time for today. Good. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank we you have. Our uh, speakers. Yes.